Good morning. Good morning. I made a, an interesting observation in the first service that uh, I want to share with all of you. Um, first of all, for those of you who are visiting, thank you. I want to, I want to reiterate what Pastor Billy said. Thank you for being with us this morning. We are uh, elated that you're here. I am not one of the pastors here. I'm just a lay leader. <clears throat> sorry. Uh, if you came expecting to see Chris, again, I'm sorry. This is being recorded. Chris, I'm sorry. Actually, not. <laughs> But let me, let me explain to you the observation. Our number is down when Chris is gone. And, and I don't understand why, because when Rob preaches, we get out early. So that's a, that's a plus. Amen? That's, <laughs> wake up, Dave. <laughs> hey, the holidays are over. Christmas is over with. I heard Billy say earlier that about two hours after they started, after they finished opening gifts, that Marshall was tearing down decorations. Uh, our, ours will be up till Easter if you want to see some. Come on. But, the, but the Christmas holiday is over. With. That means that the Christmas pies, the Christmas cakes, the cookies, and the fudge is over. Oh, praise the Lord. I got to tell you, I'm good for about two pieces of pumpkin pie a year, and then I'm done. But now fudge, that's different. But it's over with. And I like. I want to go ahead and put this out there. You may be able to relate to this. I put on a pound or 17. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I, I eat, at, especially Christmas time, I eat a lot. And so uh, I have made plans to eat healthier in the new year and to maybe shed a little bit of this weight and, and get some of it off. I'm sure when New Year's coming around, I'm sure some of us are probably got diet plans in mind or I'm going to live healthier this year Rob I'm going to, I'm going to do things that uh, take care of my body better and we are by and large and I mean this with a pun intended a society of grown waistlines yeah. America is by and large growing uh, I, I found some interesting statistics I want to share with you today the average American male the average American male weighs 195.7 pounds now, I'm a little bigger than average. Uh, and, and they're also five feet nine inches tall. Chris ain't average yet. <laughs> that's the only pastor joke I'll make today, I'll promise you. <laughs> in, in 1998, in 1998 the, the average weight of an American male, and notice I said male here, I'm not even focusing in any research units, but on males. <laughs> the male in 1998 weighed an average of 180 pounds. Now, for those of us, I'm sorry, for those of you who can remember the 1960s, in, in 1960, the average weight of an American male was 166 pounds. We have grown from 166 pounds to 195 pounds in 40 short years. Uh, last weekend, Rebecca and I visited my parents in Southeast Missouri. We were worshiping with them on Sunday morning. And I thought, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dress up a little bit and, and uh, maybe look a little bit, you know, more nicer. And, and, and uh, I pulled a pair of slacks out of the closet. Now, I know mouths are probably dropping to the floor right now because, yes, Big Rob does own some, some slacks. I actually own a suit. And it's not leather. <laughs> most, of you, most of you will probably never see it, but anyway, so I get these slacks out, this nice button-down shirt, and I brought my wingtip shoes, and uh, we headed out to Missouri. Sunday morning, we're getting ready for church, so I get up, have breakfast, and, and, and iron my clothes, and uh, I, I go to put these slacks on, and they liked about that far, the button being able to reach, and uh, but the shirt looked good, so... Uh, I got it all sucked in and got that button in there and, and all of a sudden that, that button started screaming, let it go. <laughs> I had no business being in them slacks. Uh, it shows how often I wear those. Uh, I, I was getting ready for this sermon and, and uh, I ran across this survey in 2017 that was compiled by the National Center for Health Statistics. And it showed that 
of American adults, 36% of American adults eat fast food on any given day. That's more than one in three eat fast food in any given day. Now, I broke it down a little bit more into the 45% in the age bracket from 20 to 39 eat fast food on any given day, and 37% in the 40 to 59 age bracket eat fast food on just about any given day. 24% for those over 60 uh, eat fast food. Now, here, here's, this is what this survey concluded, is that fast food is becoming more of a lifestyle than a choice. We get to, we get to running around and eating at a fast pace, and, and we're eating foods that are not only unhealthy for us, but we're eating them in an unhealthy way. We're isolating ourselves in our vehicles. Or we're eating at the soccer field, or we're running back and forth to work instead of being around the dinner table with conversation with our family. So here's my question. Are we doing the same thing with God's Word? Are we indulging in a fast-paced, make-you-feel-good devotional series? Are we looking for inspirational pep talks to satisfy our spiritual needs? Or are we feasting on the Word? Are we getting into the meat of the Scripture? Are we studying with growth intentions? Or are we reading a Bible verse in our Bible app on our phones every day so that we can put that one year badge in it? Are we feeding our souls with spiritual food for growth? Are we, are we feeding ourselves so that we can fellowship with others to encourage and sharpen each other? Or are we looking for a drive through Jesus? Are we looking for something that we can just survive with so that we can get to the next thing in our life? The title for today's sermon, and this is going to be your first fill in the blank here in just a minute, is not actually only are we maturing in the Word. I got my hand slapped a little bit when I told Amber what the what it was, and she said, we can't print that in bulletin. We can't put that on sermon notes. The, term, the sermon title is actually Fat Babies. Are we maturing in the Word? But apparently we can't print that on the sermon outline. So that's your first fill in the blanks. Are we fat babies? Is this us? Now that's a cute, cuddly, little Sharpe dog and that cute, little, snuggly baby is, is gorgeous. By the way, if you look over at Rebecca this morning and she is smiling but nodding off, there's a reason for that. Uh, we just had another grandbaby Friday. And... Uh, uh, Cruz William Young was born, and Rebecca and Nicole, our daughter, took off yesterday afternoon uh, to Lepanto, Arkansas, to go visit and hold this little snow bunny for the first time. And she got back at 1:30. I was not able to go yesterday, so that Cheshire cat look on her face is because Nanny Nanny Boo Boo, I got to hold him and you didn't, and she's still sleeping. So uh, anyway, I, I say that to ask us this: Is this us? Are we fat babies? Let me elaborate on that a little bit. We, we that classify ourselves as saved have started a brand new life. And when we started that brand new life, we were just like newborn babies. In fact, that's what we're called as babes in Christ. And as a baby grows, it needs a little something more than just mother's milk. It needs some, some food. It starts off with some pureed food and then gets into some solids. And as a Christian grows, we need more spiritual food of the Scripture. And as a baby grows, it learns to walk. It learns to talk. It learns to run. And as a Christian grows, we need to learn how to walk and talk and, and, and run by learning to minister, by learning to serve, and learning how we grow our faith. So I ask us, are we fat babies? Fill that in. Have we grown in the Lord in the time that we've been saved as Christians? You look back on the time when, when, when you became Christians, when you accepted Christ in your life. Can you look at that pathway now and say, I've grown in what the Lord has expected of me. I've grown on spiritual food. I've, I'm able to dig into the Scriptures. See, Paul dealt with this very same thing. In the book of 1 Corinthians, I'm going to uh, flip over there for just a second. I want to read something to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, Paul is, is dealing with the church in Corinth. Uh, the, the, let me give you just a little bit of background. Paul went to Corinth in AD 50 or 51, somewhere around there, and started the church in Corinth. At that time, he spent 18 months 
in Corinth as he was beginning this church. But the book of 1 Corinthians wasn't written until AD 56. So there's five years, six years, four to six years, somewhere around there, where the, the church in Corinth has, has been able to grow, where they should have been expected to grow. But let me read this to you out of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able yet to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, you are not you are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? They had five years roughly to begin to mature in the word. Five years to grow spiritually. And Paul still says, You're still fleshly. I can't even speak to you as spiritual men. You're still like babes in Christ. Let's uh, turn with me, if you would, to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. I want to I want to paint a picture now of immaturity, of, of what people see as immature Christians. Uh, stand with me when you find First uh, First Peter chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Go ahead and be seated. Let me introduce you to somebody here. This is Zeke Benton Young. This is the older brother to Cruz who was just born the other day. And this is one of the cutest grandsons in the world. Would you not agree? I, in my world he is. I don't care about yours. This is my world. This, what, Zeke, what you can't see in this picture is Zeke is holding uh, a Thomas the Tank Engine car. And Thomas is his favorite toy in the entire world. Zeke uh, is a 2016 model. So he is still learning how to navigate in this life. He's still learning how, how to act. He's still learning how to treat other people. And Zeke can't take that Thomas the Tank Engine with him into his church. He can't take it into his daycare class. Because when Zeke puts it down to go get a snack, if somebody picks it up, Zeke acts with malice <laughs> to get this thing back. Now, I love my grandson. He is the bomb. But he's still learning. He's learning how to share. He's learning those things that are that are that are prerequisites in life to be able to succeed. He's learning how to act. He's learning how to mature. What happens when you ask one of your children, who did this? Who made this mess? He did. Well, what, what, what happens when, when you ask, what? Who, who painted your sister? She did. When, when we ask our kids that, when we ask our kids, who made this mess? Who did these things? They always point the finger at somebody else because they don't want to fall back on them. They're acting with deceit. They're going to slander little brother or little sister Go, she made me do it. He talked me into it. I'm innocent in this. See, they don't know how to act. But children have to learn to mature. They have to grow up. Otherwise, they'll continue to practice meism. They want what's for them, or they want what's theirs right now. Let me read a passage for you from 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. It says, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loved the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. And if we're, if we're in love with the world, then there's no way that we're going to be able to mature spiritually. Spiritual growth is inhibited by our lack of conviction. We can't, we can't show Christ as our complete conviction if we still love the world. 
We can't show Christ as our complete conviction if we still practice lust of the eyes or lust of the flesh or the boastful pride of life. If Christ is not our complete conviction, we're not going to grow spiritually. We won't know Him more and we won't show others anything but our faulty convictions. So let me paint a picture for you for five things that spiritual maturity is not. These are the first five things on your notes. I lost my set of... Is anybody got a set of sermon notes that I can borrow for a second so I don't know where I'm at? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Five things that spiritual maturity knows is not. Number one, pride in how much Bible you know. Now, there are some Christians out there, and I hope there's not any in this church, that strut their biblical knowledge like it's an accomplishment. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 says, Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. See, Paul's dealing with, with, with Corinthians here that know what sacrifice is about. They know what to sacrifice and what not to sacrifice. They know what not to sacrifice to. And all that knowledge puffed up their arrogance. But love builds everything up. So why do we use the Bible as a barricade instead of a bridge? We go around beating people over the head. Well, well, see, it says right here that you can't do that. Or it says right here you can't do this. Instead of using that as a bridge to show grace, to show the truth, to show love, we try to impart our biblical knowledge on everybody else. But I want to ask you this. Do you know the Bible? Or do you know the author of the Bible? About Number two, the second thing that spiritual maturity is not is truth without grace. Now every time Jesus spoke, every time, He was always grace-filled. And when we show the truth, if we don't include grace, and if we don't practice grace, then the truth that we show loses its effect. Before Jesus, there was the law, and the law was the truth. But Jesus came to be the grace that filtered the law. Grace and truth were both realized through Jesus. The third thing that spiritual maturity is not is grace without truth. Now, we can't live a life of grace and not seek the truth. And we can't live a life of grace and not know the truth of what grace actually is. Let me introduce something to you here for you to remember. Remember, grace has a backbone. And we nailed that backbone to a cross. Amen, brother. Number four. The fourth thing that spiritual maturity is not is harshness to outsiders while cutting insiders slack. I love this. Because we talk about how bad it is in the world. We talk about the things where Christianity can't progress because of, of, because of boundaries and things that, that, are, that are blocking us. How bad it is in the world. But we don't want to admit our own sinful nature. We don't want to admit that the things that, that, that we're complaining about is complaining. We complain about being complained about. And I want to ask you this. If God so loved the world, who decided that we shouldn't? Because everything around us is lost. Who decided that, that, that we can't Love this world and, and, and be a light to this world that's against us. The fifth thing that spiritual maturity is not is telling other people that you're mature. Remember Paul's credentials? Paul, Paul lists out uh, several things in Philippians chapter 3 that, that, that kind of gave him what he was. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He can trace his Jewish heritage all the way back to the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. But he considered all that rubbish so that he could gain Christ. See, Paul, this spiritual giant, the last of the true apostles that, that was shown the light on the way to Damascus, the one who had spoke with the Lord, that wrote... Most of, the whole, uh, most of the New Testament, this spiritual giant wanted to be humble. You see, 
Paul's maturity equals humbleness. And our spiritual maturity should equal humbleness. Now let's paint a picture of what others see in us. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Please stand and let's read uh, verses 22 through 27. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another and envying one another. Please receive it. In one of his commentaries, R.C. Sproul said this about the fruits of the Spirit. He said, The gifts of the Holy Spirit are fascinating and exciting. To be a gifted person is to receive accolades from our fellows for our performances or abilities. For these reasons, and perhaps others, the gifts of the Spirit receive far more attention in our culture than the fruit of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit seem to be due to obscurity, hot, hidden in the shadow of the more preferred gifts. Yet, it is the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit that is the mark of our progress and sanctification. Of course, God is pleased when we dutifully exercise the gifts of the Holy Spirit He has bestowed upon us. But I think God is even more pleased when He sees His people manifest the fruit of the Spirit. He breaks it all down to say, it's the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit in your life. That, that evidence marks your spiritual maturity. See, we can't pick and choose which one of these fruits of the Spirit we want to excel in. This is a nine-fold statement that includes every one of them. And, and for us to demonstrate growth in this is to demonstrate our maturity as a Christian. Because without love, the joy of the Lord can never be our strength. Love is the base foundation that we operate in. Fill that in your mind. Love is the base foundation that we operate in. And without love, we can never find the peace from God or with God. Without God, without love, long suffering or patience is impossible. Without love, gentleness or kindness is just a foreign term to us. Without love, goodness or righteousness can never be found in us. Without love, faithfulness cannot be hoped for. Because our blinders cover our hearts. And without love, meekness becomes meanness. Without love, self-control becomes control of everything. And because of Christ, our greatest goal should be to do everything through love. Let me read for you 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. Let me get to it here real quick. 1 John 4, 16. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God. And God abides in Him. Everything we just talked about with the fruits of the Spirit has got to be based in love. Everything. Because the fruits of the Spirit are what we want people to see us moving forward in. When we exercise our fruits, we grow we grow spiritually. And our growth is what our sanctification is. Sanctification equals spiritual maturity. And because we are becoming more spiritually mature, because we grow through this sanctification, we have a desire to be closer to God. Because we grow spiritually, we have that desire to fulfill that 2 Timothy 2.15 Scripture that says, Study to show yourself approved. 
study to show study to show yourselves mature. Study to show yourselves that you're growing. That sanctification is your life. And we should want to study so that we can show all those around us that we are mature. And because we want to be closer to God, we should want to be separated from the world. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. By constantly feasting on spiritual food. By growing maturing and, and, and growing spiritually. Let me introduce somebody else to you. This is McCullough Presley Haycraft. She is one of the cutest granddaughters in the world. Would you not agree? McCullough is eight, and she has always been Paul's girl. She's always been my bonky doodle. She's been the one that is when something was wrong, she wanted her paw paw. When she was six, she wanted her paw paw. When she when she does something great in school, she wants to let paw paw know. I talk to her on Snapchat about four times a week, um, and she calls it some of the most oddest times. Like, let me tell you what I did, but anyway. When she, was, uh, when she was a baby and she was learning to walk, I would sit her up on the counter in our kitchen. And I'd take a step back and I'd say, McCullough, jump. And she'd say, no. McCullough, jump. No. You see, McCullough knew me. She knew her papa, but she didn't actually trust me enough yet because that relationship wasn't quite where she wanted it to be to where she could trust me because she hasn't grown in that relationship yet. But when she did this right here, I'm here. I'm here. And I took a step forward. And she jumps in my arms. And when we ask the Lord to draw near, when we ask God to draw us closer to Him, and we can jump in His arms, our spiritual maturity begins right there. When we ask God to take us, when we ask God to let me jump into your arms, the first step of our spiritual maturity starts right there. So let's paint a picture of how we become spiritually mature. Turn with me to Psalms chapter 1. I found the sermon notes today. Psalms chapter 1. <laughs> Please stand and let's read verses 1 through 3 together. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. Please be seated. So this is a picture of how we mature spiritually. Let's break this down a little bit. Let's, let's, let's look at this. First of all, how blessed is the man who does not walk? Blessed. Blessed is a plural term here that means joyous and happy. Fill that in your mind. Joyous and happy. Now, this is we're starting off with actually what the end result of spiritual maturity actually is. So, how when we're spiritually mature, we understand that we're joyous and happy because we're blessed. How blessed is the man who does not walk. Who does not walk in the council. This is advice. Plain and simple. Where are you getting your advice from? Who is it that you're asking those questions to? Does not walk in the council. Nor stand in the path of sinners. Stand. To endure. To participate. To, to act like. Who are we behaving like? Nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Where are we sitting? Who are we dwelling with? Who are we settled in with? Now, 
when I, several years ago, began recovery, I, I found out that I had to change my playground and my playmates. I had to change the things that I was, the things that I was doing and the places that I was doing it and who I was doing it with. I had to, I had to build a whole new life on godly things instead of what Rob wanted to do. I had to change those things. So I had to change who I was settled in with. I had to change who I was getting advice from. I had to change a lot of things. But the most important thing that I had to change is this. But His delight is in the law of the Lord. What's your passion? What's your desire? What is it that you chase after? There's a book by Louis Giglio called The Air We Breathe. And I love this book. It's, I call it a bathroom reader. It's small and it's one of those I can read in the bathrooms, man. Uh, it's palmable, so it's really a man-sized book, you know, in the bathroom. So get in there and you read this book, and, and Louis says, I can, I can follow what you treasure in your life. You can follow what you treasure in your life and see what ultimately you worship. Whether it be the Titans, or whether it be hunting, or fishing, or even Harley Davidson. What, what, what you treasure in your life is what ultimately you're going to worship. What is your passion? What is it that you delight in? Is it Major League Baseball? Please ask for forgiveness if it's the Chicago Cubs. Is it, but is, is, it, is it the Titans? Is it your job? Is it chasing after money? What's your desire? What's your passion? Because ultimately, folks, that's what we worship. And in His law, He meditates day and night. What are we filling our minds with? What is it that, that we're thinking about? What is it that we're focused on? Are we focused on His Word? Are, are, are we focused on... On, on, on digging deeper into Scripture or we focus more into finding out what His will for our lives is by getting into Scripture? Or are we concerned about what's on social media? Are we concerned about what the latest news story is about what we can't do in society now? What are we, what are we focused on? When I, was a, when I was young, my mom said, to, to import this into me, she said, what you think is what you'll become. Keep thinking like that, and that's what you'll do. I think it had something to do with facial expressions or something. Like that. What she was telling me is, what, what, I, what I think, what, what, I, what I pull my thoughts out of, what I, what, I, what I concentrate on is what I'm going to end up becoming. Good thing I changed my thoughts, because back then I wanted to be a rock star. But the things that we think about, the things that we put in our heads, the things that we concentrate on, that's what we're going to become. Do we want to be more like Jesus? Or do we want to focus on becoming the next executive? The next head of the department? Do we want to focus on, on, on earthly wealth and earthly possessions? Or eternal possessions? What are we going to focus on? So my two questions to you are this. Where are your roots? Are they firmly planted by the stream that's going to continue to bring water? Are they, are they deep rooted in the Word of God? Are we rooting ourselves in, in, in what, we, what we know to be truth and what we know to be grace? And how are you watering your Where are you getting your advice from? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you getting? Remember when I started this sermon, I was talking about how we eat fast food and we don't sit around the table as a family anymore. Who are you fellowshipping with? Are you are you breaking bread and fellowshipping and being held accountable by brothers and sisters who are giving you godly counsel? 
by people who want to see you grow, that want to grow together with you. How are you watering your roots? I saw this quote from a guy named Jared C. Wilson. And Jared is uh, one of the directors at the Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Kansas City, Missouri. He's also uh, a pretty accomplished writer and author. He wrote a book called Gospel Wakefulness and several others. But uh, Jared says this, he said, there comes a time when every church has to decide whether they're actually a church or just a place where you go to get your theology petted. You see, we can grow and spiritually mature individually and come together as a body so that this body can mature or we can come here and get our theology petted. Let me ask you this. Are we a church that wants to mature? Are we a church that wants to learn more of God's Word? Are we a church that's willing to love? Or are we just a group of people that unintentionally identifies as an amen corner and identifies as that amen corner to feel good about the work that the pastoral staff does? Where are we? Are we fat babies? Are, are, are we trying to mature in the Word? Or do we just want to get fast food and, and, and stay, stay spiritually immature? What are we? Let's pray. Father God, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the blessing of grace. Thank You for the truth that Your Word brings us. Father, thank You that You never fail to love us. That You've shown us what love is. That we, that we seek to know more about Your love through Jesus. Thank You that we have that sacrifice. Thank You, God, that because of that sacrifice, we have the freedom in You that, that is Your truth. So Father, I pray that You would, that you would grow us. I pray that we would, we would desire more of You, that we would desire more of, of who You are and what You are. And that we would desire to be closer to You. Oh, forgive us for the times where we have let You down. Forgive us for the times where we have looked to our own devices, our own, our own means. Father, show us how to mature in You. In Jesus' name we pray.